Hello, everyone. Uh, I think we might get started now. So next up, we have a local Christchurch person who's returned uh, to give us this fascinating talk on getting insight from data without seeing the data, blind analytics. So please welcome Brian Thorne. Hello. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from New Zealand. I studied here at University of Canterbury and then worked at uh, Dynamic Controls. Um, and there's a few dynamic people here, which is cool. Um, about 18 months ago, I moved over the ditch to Sydney and started working at NICTA, National ICT Australia. They do ICT research in Australia. Um, as of last week, that's no longer true, apparently. Um, we merged with the Crown Research Institute called CSIRO because Tony Abbott and research. Um, so now I think I work at this company. Um, anyway, with that, let us begin. I'd like to start with a bit of a story. I got, um, I got engaged last year. And uh, even before, yay! <laughs> and even before I'd like told many of my friends or family, online advertising changed so sharply. It just pivoted to displaying adverts about wedding catering, about wedding photography, um, and rings. And it was just really quite scary. I probably mentioned it in a couple of private chat messages via Facebook or um, Google Hangouts or something at this stage. Um, but in a matter of hours, it was ever a um, online. Today's machine learning algorithms are making better inferences than ever before. And this is due to advances across the board. Research continues on new algorithms, of course. Hardware improvements have made new things that were infeasible just a few years ago now feasible. And things like distributed computing, GPU programming have made immense impacts as well. <clears throat> we also have better data, more accurate data, more types of data. Insights are being Insights are taking inputs from a wide, wide range of sources. But probably most crucially, we have a lot more data. As well as this, the technology is actually getting a lot easier to use as it's getting more and more of a commodity. Large cloud service providers are offering um, not just access to heaps of machines, but a lot of that you don't have to pay very much for, but they're now offering machine learning APIs. Um, Google has a prediction API, so does Microsoft's Azure. Azure. Azure, um, and Amazon ML, um, for instance. High-end graphics cards can also tackle a lot of machine learning algorithms these days. And the spot rate for a Amazon GPU instance is in the order of 10 cents an hour. It hardly takes any effort to get access to dozens of these $2,000 graphics cards. Um, and while it's easier to use machine learning algorithms, the understanding of what the limitations of each algorithm are, how to interpret the results, it's it's kind of quite immature. So smarter, easier, better, yes, but certainly not perfect and not without problems. So the very real, the very personal human um, issues associated with insightful machine learning was discussed at PyCon AU earlier this year by um, Karina Zona in her keynote, Consequences of, a, uh, Consequences of an Insightful Algorithm. I really recommend watching it. It's well worth it. So while the insights might be wrong, um, or too revealing, all too often it's actually the raw data that's leaked. This is uh, obviously bad. Leaked data can be combined with other data sets uh, and you can draw even more revealing conclusions. So what can we do to prevent so much personal data potentially being leaked um, and being vulnerable and being stored in one place? I'm going to focus entirely on possible technical solutions to this, not the uh, personal human, what we can do and how we can change practices. Most of these are kind of fairly active research topics, but I'm not approaching them as like, hey, here's some cutting edge research which isn't really possible. Um, this is, these are concrete possible solutions that, are, that can be done today. So private data can be really hard, hard to get hold of, and not, not that hard. I mean, ask yourself, think about this, how, how carefully do you review the application permissions when you install an app on your phone these days um, for every app? How carefully do you read the small print or the terms and conditions on a website? How many apps do you think you have installed that uh, track your physical whereabouts? And how many websites track your digital wanderings? Hands up if you think hospitals would probably protect their patients' data pretty well. <laughs> no? Well, how about a government? Do you trust the government to look after your stuff? A little? <laughs> Workplace? Your school, university, corporations, apps, all of these treat them in a completely different way. But 
probably everybody agrees that as a user you care about your privacy, and many organizations do as well. For, for many, privacy of their users' information is a really big priority. Often this is because they know a big breach um, would erode the user's trust and cause many people to leave them. But, and sometimes your data is kept very safe because it's very commercially sensitive. Um, think of things like insurance risk, credit risk. In many situations, your data is offered some protection by uh, privacy legislation. But this varies very, very widely uh, depending on where you are, the location in the world, and on the type of data. Many organizations have decided that some small, non-trivial amount of their customers' information is worth sharing. The cost-benefit analysis obviously comes down to the side of it's worth selling or sharing customers' data quite often. So between two or more organizations, how is that done today? When organizations decide to share some of their data, at the moment they bring it together. More often than not, they use a intermediary, such as Veda or Experian, to act as uh, trusted third parties. And there are some restrictions, which some organizations sometimes obey. Um, these could be governance, legal requirements, their own privacy concerns, policies, and uh, at times they are really concerned with the consent they've got from users. Um, but they still decide to do it a lot of the time. So what is it organizations are getting out of this sharing? It could be for really good reasons, of course. Um, something like collecting aggregate information, maybe about patient care across hospitals in a region. But unfortunately, sometimes these solutions are very um, inflexible, um, especially when it comes to medical data. The legislation prevents a lot of things. And so you sometimes have to have legislational change before you can do useful aggregations and statistics that might be useful. Um, the reason a lot of organizations do it is for monetization. Um, by simply selling the raw data or customer insights, either of those, with other orga interested organizations, they find a new revenue stream. Um, and it could be that alone they don't have the necessary amount or quality of features, data, information, um, to make predictions and classifications and other inferences that they want for their business needs. To try to do a uh, Raymond Hedinger from the PyCon US talks, there must be a better way. So instead of trusting a third party for many problems, it is actually often possible to do data mining um, while preserving the privacy of the raw data. Just think about the implications of this for a second. You wouldn't have the capability to see the raw data. You couldn't bring up a table in Excel and see it all. But you could still solve the problems that you're trying to do, run your analyses. Even using sensitive data, uh, that couldn't or shouldn't be put on cloud services. So, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Cross-border insights can be um, really difficult with uh, some types of information. Um, and I think I, I just mentioned medical information is very heavily restricted. Um, different countries have very different laws when it comes um, with regard to data privacy. I've got a, a, toy, a toy example just to, just to think about, just as an illustration. Problem involves two millionaires, Alice and Bob. This isn't a problem I've struggled with, unfortunately. Alice and Bob are interested in knowing which of them is richer, but they don't want to reveal their actual wealth. And uh, there, there are lots of solutions to this from the cryptography field um, in, in, a, in a way that actually does preserve that, that number and just works out the yes or no, which is greater. Um, it can be extended to n participants instead of just two people. You compare a group. And uh, other variants of this, instead of doing solving for effectively um, argmat, uh, for greater than, they can privately work out of a group the mean, the median, the standard deviation, etc., um, of essentially a distributed value like that, a group's wealth um, or salary. Now, this can be applied to things like uh, voting in a privacy preserving way. What candidate do you prefer the most? The, the crux of it is it is possible, at times, to uh, gain the insight from data without seeing the data. And this topic lies at the, the intersection of uh, cryptography, privacy, and machine learning. I'm going to attempt to uh, introduce some of these. There's mo a multiple of techniques. Um, and in these, I don't want to just do the mean and the, a greater than or a standard deviation. So we're, we're going to look at some of the more advanced uh, learning techniques instead of just descriptive stats. The types of things that are possible 
um, include k-means clustering, PCA, linear, logistic regression. And they usually work in one of two ways. You either leave the data at its source, where it's measured, um, and bring the algorithm to the data, or share deltas, share updates. So think Internet of Things, um, if you've got a whole lot of devices, instead of pooling all your resources and all your data into one centralized server, you leave the data at the leaf, at the node. Uh, or, and the second way is you upload encrypted data and you can do your analysis on encrypted data in the centralized server. And that way you get the advantage of using your Amazons and your Azures and whatnot, but it's all encrypted data. It doesn't matter if it gets leaked. It doesn't mean much to anyone. In either case, you learn the insight, the model, without ever seeing the private raw data, which means you're not really at you're not as at, at much as much at risk, and neither are your customers and their data, or your users. So, uh, one way that this is is done or can be done is business to business. It's possible to learn simple machine le uh, learning models where some of the features, think columns in Excel. Um, are never brought together. They never reside in the same place. So think about uh, targeted news feeds, which you get in Facebook, or your targeted advertising, where the raw information, what you buy, where you were, when you shop, all of that stuff could be separate and stored separately. Um, this example in particular scares me a bit. Um, I don't think just a technology solution is going to be the answer. There's certainly going to be some policy things in there as well. Medical research should definitely benefit from this in the near future. For example, individual hospitals could keep their own, obviously very detailed patient records private, but these hospitals and patients wanted to, they could participate across um, all of the hospitals. They could, they could do um, research, building models or illness prediction, um, which could learn across all of the private data, which is stored in the separate hospitals and never pulled in one place, so that if something went wrong, and something is leaked, it's not everybody's all at once. All right, so now I'm going to get on to some of these methods. I say I'm going to try and introduce a couple of methods. The first one is secret sharing. So you have a space, a space in 3D. Secret sharing or secret splitting is a method for splitting a secret amongst a group. Each participant is going to be given a share, they're allocated a share, and the secret can only be reconstructed when a sufficient number um, a threshold of participants decide to combine the results. Um, this, this illustration kind of should help to explain it. So our secret is just a point in this box, some position. Now the first participant is given a um, share, which is just a description of a plane. It's important, of course, um, that the secret point is part of the plane that the first participant gets. Hopefully following so far. Now the second participant is also given a share. They're given another plane. The point uh, that is our secret is hopefully also on this plane. Now if these two decide to collude, then there's a whole line of possible places where they, they intersect. Combining two um, planes yields a line intersection, and obviously there's quite a few points in an infinite line, so that doesn't give away too much. But when three or more of the people come together who have one of these planes, we can finally reveal the point right in the middle where the three planes inter intersect, which is our secret. So here there are only three planes, but you could easily do more as long as the secret point goes through them. Um, and of course, you could increase the number of dimensions. The same applies. The names just get a lot cooler because you're doing, dealing with hypercubes and things, um, and intersections of hypercubes. So this secret sharing threshold scheme is called Blakely's scheme. It's one of many. Um, I just chose this one because it's much easier to visualize than just math equations, um, seeing planes. <clears throat> what would it be used for? Or what is secret sharing good for, rather? It's good for really highly sensitive data, meaning you don't want any individual to have access to the information, and highly important data, meaning you really, really don't want to lose the information. So uh, I'm thinking things like missile launch codes, maybe encryption keys to your secret formulas or something. Now normal encryption, uh, sorry, uh, asymmetric encryption isn't that good here. It doesn't give you the properties simultaneously of giving you high confidence and high reliability. Say your company has a secret formula and you wish to keep it secret and you also don't want to lose it. So normal encryption would force you to make the decision. Either you keep one copy of your encryption key, 
which means you don't have that much reliability because if you lose it, you can't decrypt the data, it's, you've lost it. Um, the alternative is you distribute multiple copies of the key, which lowers the uh, confidentiality. If any one of these key holders decides, oh, maybe they'll just decrypt the secret formula, have a look at it, copy it to their personal computer without being encrypted, then, uh, and makes a mistake, the company's secret would be revealed. So the difficulty lies in creating schemes that give you both. <coughs> uh, so with secret sharing, we can uh, do something where you have n shares, um, that are required in order to access the raw data. So to put that a little bit more concrete detail, um, the, say the president of a company um, should be able to access the formula anytime they want, but in an emergency, any three out of 12 board members should be able to collude and do the same. So this would be accomplished um, using a secret sharing scheme, or could be accomplished. You'd give the president three shares and everyone else on the board gets one, and then any time either three of them got together or the president wanted to, they could decrypt something. All good? Cool. Uh, the next one is secure multi-party computation. And that allows a set of parties to compute a function over their inputs while preserving input privacy and correctness. So MPC has been an active, active um, area of research for like 30 years. And the last decade, it's just taken off um, significant interest and significant advances for applied MPC. It can now be used as a um, practical solution to various real life um, problems like distributed voting, private bidding auctions, um, and things like sharing of signatures or decryption functions. Um, most MPC protocols actually make use of secret sharing. Um, which means a set number of the participants need to collude in order to be able to retrieve information. And it allows arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication and more complex operations uh, like k-means clustering that I mentioned earlier is possible under secure multi-party computation. A little bit of a mouthful. Um, now I'm going to attempt to show you a demo. If I can get my mouse over here. One tick. Okay, oh, that will do. Okay, so we have two companies, and this is a business to business example. We're combining, combining vertically partitioned data, and we're going to carry out clustering for the purpose of identifying outliers. So resolution here. Um, on the left, we have the two separate companies, the green one and the blue one, uh, a finance company and a travel company. Now, to make it as simple as possible, they're each going to have one dimension of data. So they've got one column, uh, the monthly spend of their customers and the number of trips of their customers for the travel company. Now, if you could bring that together, and that looks horrible on this resolution, if you could bring that together, the two dimensions show very clearly three clusters, and you could potentially um, see outliers if um, you could run this. Now, k-means clustering converges to the cluster centers, and then you could ask how far away are things from these cluster centers um, and find outliers. Now, if you look at the data itself, which I'm not sure if I can get a better view of that. If you look at the data itself, you don't see the outliers. Like They're very clear, clearly within the one-dimensional um, clusters. Um, and so bringing it together does give you a clear um, advantage. You can identify fraudulent users, anomalous behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So it's useful. But bringing it together gives you another attack vector. Um, so we want to have the benefit of the last graph, this, without actually ever having the data in one place, without sharing the data. So that this graph is not possible, or should not be, just illustrates the outliers. Um, yeah, that was a replay of an experiment. A lot of these uh, schemes actually take quite a long time. This particular one was in the order of five minutes as opposed to seconds. Um, and it's based on secure multi-party computation instead of public private key cryptography. There's a, um, not, not this, not something we've done, but AES encryption can also be done in the same scheme. And that uses in the order of 30,000 and an OR gate. Um, which is quite impressive, and running completely privacy preserving. If I can go back to my slides, cool. Okay, differential privacy, 
another, another technique for privacy preserving analytics. It's a very powerful approach to um, protecting individuals' privacy in data mining. So in cryptography, differential privacy aims to provide, um, maximize the accuracy of queries from a statistical database while minimizing the chances of identifying its records. Um, to try give you an intuitive way to think about that, differential private data mining protect the individuals by injecting noise. So a little bit of randomness here and there, which covers up the impact of a, um, a single individual can have on a query. So um, <clears throat> consider a trusted, trusted party that holds a data set of sensitive information, something like medical records, voter registrations, emails, um, with the goal of providing global statistics um, and aggregate information about that data publicly available, while preserving the privacy of the users whose information is in the data set, such a system we call a statistical database. In the recent past, ad hoc approaches to this, um, to anonymizing public records, um, have kind of failed. Researchers managed to de-identify personal information, often by linking to such um, things that have been released together, or innocuously um, unrelated databases. One successful uh, such linkage attack was the Netflix database. So in um, 2006, Netflix offered a million dollars for anyone who could improve their recommendation system by 10%. And they released a data set um, for the competitors, for the developers to use to train their system. And while releasing the data set, they provided a disclaimer to protect customer privacy, all personal information identifying individual customers has been removed, and customer ID has been replaced by just randomly assigned IDs. Now, Netflix isn't the only available data set on movie ratings on the web, and there are others like IMDb. And on IMDb, individuals can register for free, rate movies if they want to, and they have the option of publishing their profile, like not keeping their um, ratings private. Now, researchers at um, University of Texas linked the Netflix um, training data set with the IMDb publicly available records, and they compromised many, maybe even most, of the users' identities. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how differential privacy works, other than kind of mentioning it gives you a knob of control to go between more accurate or more private. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a trade-off between the accuracy of the statistics you're um, estimating in a privacy-preserving manner and the privacy parameter, like a, an epsilon, essentially. <coughs> um, right, I have some creepy faces as a demo. That's right. Dun, dun, dun. Um. OK. This, this was done in Python, although this is not using any right now, because it's all just showing in JavaScript. Um, anyone know PCA? Yes, some. Good. Um, so it's a statistical um, machine learning algorithm-ish for um, finding the principal component um, vectors. And it's really simple when you look at it in uh, 2D, which I thought I had. Doesn't matter. Um, finding, finding the uh, principal um, vector through some data in two dimensions. But you can also do it for faces. Um, so at, at Nicta, we made a prototype or a demo just showing that we could do, um, using differential privacy, um, eigenfaces, which is essentially just calculating eigenvectors using images, um, completely privately. So each update step, um, these are separate nodes or calculating a shared model of what the, um, the face from all the faces they've seen before it, uh, actually looks like. But they do it in such a way that everything they share is just a delta, just a difference between what you gave me last time, the data I have locally, here's what you need to change. Um, and it does it in a way that guarantees anonymity, um, which is kind of cool. OK. Um, so homomorphic encryption, does that mean anything to anyone? One, two, three, yes, cool. Actually, for everyone else then, let's just do a quick recap on asymmetric encryption. So asymmetric encryption uh, works by, first of all, you create a key pair. 
public key algorithms are based on mathematical problems that currently have no efficient solutions. These um, problems are inherent in certain factor, integer factorizing, discrete logarithm, and elliptic curve relationships. It's computationally easy for a user to generate a public key, a public-private key pair, and use it for encryption decryption. The strength lies in that it's uh, the impossibility or computational impracticality of um, reversing that. For a properly generated private key to be determined when all you see is a message and its public key. Um, thus the public key can be published without compromising your security at all, unlike with symmetric encryption, and the security depends only on keeping the private key private. As in in an uh, asymmetric key encryption scheme, anyone can encrypt a message just using your public key, but only the holder of the private key, um, which is paired, can decrypt it. Uh, asymmetric encryption is also used for signatures, um, where it's just the other way around. Private keys used to sign the content, and anyone with the public key can verify that it was a valid signature. Now, one form of this is RSA. RSA was one of the first, if not the first, I'm not sure, public key cryptography systems, and it's still widely used um, to secure data transmission today. The security is based on the um, practical difficulty of factoring the product of two large primes, appropriately called the uh, factoring problem. So these are the only, uh, only um, equations I've got, I promise. M is the uh, message, which is transformed into a number, but for our sakes, let's just assume it's a number already, because we're thinking about data analytics, and the public key is composed of uh, two numbers, n and e. c is the ciphertext uh, that's transmitted, say, from Alice to Bob. Private key um, is just one number, d, but you usually know the um, public key as well, and that's just used for decryption. Now, RSA has the interesting property, which math geeks may be able to work out just from looking at those two equations, but probably you need to know how the uh, public and private key numbers are generated. But it has this interesting property that the product of two ciphertexts is equal to the encryption of the product of their respective plaintext. And this is called a homomorphism. Normally to avoid these problems, practical RSA actually uh, implementations, they typically embed some sort of structured randomized padding into the value before into the value M before encrypting it. And that prevents this. Um, so you can't multiply ciphertext together and get the um, result as if you'd multiplied things. Like they, they consider it a flaw. But when you look at it um, now, cryptographers are looking at this as like a very, very closely and other systems which have similar homomorphic properties um, and thinking maybe we can exploit this. Which brings me to the Paleo crypto system. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my, my last demo before I go into this. One tech. I didn't full screen. Where am I here? Okay. This one may or may not fit. I'm going to pretend I'm a doctor, and this is your personal tablet or your personal mobile phone. This one's more of a proof of, uh, yeah, proof of concept. Um, it's a little bit more polished. Now, what um, I'm going to assume is that you've had your genome sequenced, and that's cheaper to do these days, like $100 or something, you can get your genome sequenced from 23andMe. And you've, you've got it loaded up on your personal device. So you've come into the doctor and um, say, I've diagnosed you and I've said, oh, sorry, it looks like you're going to need a blood, thin a blood thinner. Um, the drug I'm going to prescribe is warfarin. Now, there's a classical way where I can determine the dosage for this. And there's a newfangled way, but you need to have this, this app. You need to have um, your genome sequenced. And you say, yes, of course, I've got that. I'm up to date. Um, I've got my genome with me. And so I say, oh, OK, cool. Uh, let's, let's go through and do the warfarin dose um, test then. Um, it's going to say, oh, I need access to your genome, but I'm going to do it in a privacy-preserving way, and I'm going to need access to your basic bio, um, things like your age, your weight, your sex. Um, we decide that's all right, we participate. It asks a couple of other questions that are relevant for this particular warfarin dosage calculation. Um, in this case, it asks, um, 
whether I take some particular um, drugs which might conflict with it. So it looks kind of terrible on the screen. And uh, then it goes ahead and calculates something privately on the device using your cell phone or your tablet then and there and gives us a result of 34 milligrams per week apparently is the dose for the random things I clicked. Now that in itself is kind of impressive just like that but what I'm not telling you is that that's keeping two things secret. The algorithm used then could have been a commercial secret that a pharmaceutical company did not want to share with you and have on your device and the uh, genome is obviously something you want to keep secret and don't want to send to a pharmaceutical company. Um, using the Paleo crypto system, we can actually keep secrets from both sides and still work out something simple. Now, in this case, it's a really simple operation. We're doing a dot product between um, your genetic in information and your phenotype with uh, the weights from the pharmaceutical company. But as I was showing with the k-means clustering, the PCA, a lot of other more complicated algorithms are possible too. Um, how are we for time? Like, done? Let's, let, let's, let's stop there. I've got um, one library I'd like to share, um, if I can put it up. Not full screen. If you're interested in looking at the Paleo crypto system, we, um, at NICTA we open sourced um, here, um, github.com slash NICTA slash python dash Paleo, and it's um, a partially homomorphic encryption system for Python. Um, yeah, there's lots of docs on uh, Read the Docs because I've run out of time to show examples. But it works, it's tested, you should try it. Things are possible. Um, yeah. So we've got time for maybe one or two questions. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand and I'll run the microphone to you. This is going back to your Netflix example, matching two data sets, because um, I'm working for the New Zealand government, um, one of the agencies that look after import, export, biosecurity, food safety, and that kind of stuff. Really interesting data sets. Disclaimer, this is me. I'm not speaking for the ministry or anything. Um, oh yeah, because ditto. there is obviously public demand for, hey, can you release data, and why not, and it's good for research, and many, many other things, and good causes. Um, but there's a real threat in terms of identifying people, organizations, and these yeah. inadvertently. Um, the recent example I came across was um, forestry. New Zealand is really lucky having really good records in terms of the forestry um, and um, would be good for research. But you could, for example, identify um, the only person um, planting palm trees and match that with Lynn's data, and suddenly, yep, you actually can tell exactly who it is and whatnot. And if you're an activist, then burn down their stuff because you don't like palm trees, palm yep. oil, and things like that. So there is a real confusion. And uh, hearing kind of what you presented was like, what is possibly an easy way out if there is one or not? What's your thought on this? <laughs> I don't think there's an easy way out. And you certainly have to approach it with a lot of care. Um, so yes, you could go down the differential private, like anonymizing the database, and then have a, um, a release that you make once. And that, that could work. That can certainly work. Um, find someone who's maybe done some work in that area, um, I would recommend. But you can also take two other approaches. You could release things at different aggregation levels. So when you've got a broader, um, uh, what are the zip code piece uh, and what's the wider local body areas, et cetera. I'm not very familiar with geography. Um, things like, like that, though, you, you can release different um, precisions um, at four different levels. That's, that's one approach. Um, just trying to think how that could relate. For forestry, it seems like you know, for this area, you could release um, the data set with this much accuracy. Um, but another approach would be you can ask people to send you what they want to run, and you run it, and then you just release the results. Because the insight, whatever the model is they're trying to learn, probably doesn't contain anything that you're too scared to release, um, probably. Um, you know, maybe they're classifying bad trees or something, um, but, and they want to run that with the large amounts of data you have available inside government. And 
if you can set that up in such a way where someone can go to you and we want to run this thing, it's going to do stochastic gradient descent using all this data, and you know, there's obviously some effort on both sides here. Um, but the model itself might be something you're willing to release, just not the raw data. It's another way you can approach it anyway. How fast is the field moving? It mean pretty quick, pretty quick. So um, yeah, there've been a lot of announcements ev even in the last few months from uh, places like MIT have put out a new program, Enigma. Um, eth Ethereum is another another cool one that's a few weeks ago got a lot of traction, which does privacy preserving stuff um, on the blockchain uh, using a Bitcoin or otherwise blockchain, so you can you can see um, a clear record of what has happened. Um, they're not using it for transactions, but. Yeah, it's, it's moving pretty fast, uh, that's for sure. I'm sorry, we probably don't have time for any more questions. Uh, the conference close will be in a few minutes. If you have any more questions, uh, Brian's on Twitter and he's here for yeah. the closing. Come say hi. <laughs> um, but yeah, please join me in thanking Brian.